So Andy, I look forward to catching up with you today. A lot of things I want to talk about, but first I was hoping that you could define for me what a zero trust approach to cybersecurity is and tell me a little bit about how any type of organization would go about implementing zero trust as a strategy. Well, zero trust is certainly getting a lot of attention. It's been around for years, but uh, in the United States, the, uh, the emphasis of the, the government-wide approach to cybersecurity is, is really considering the zero trust model. Department of Defense is going to be rolling out a plan. Essentially, it's a departure from the old trust but verify approach, sort of a sense that uh, once you had clearance at a firewall to get into a network, you're good to go. So th this, this model is a never trust, always verify model. So essentially, it's requiring all users, even those inside the enterprise network, to be authenticated, authorized, and continuously validated in terms of the security configuration posture before moving forward. So it really helps create sort of a micro segmentation. So it helps minimize the damage and helps lessen the possibility that the bad guys get in and then they can migrate throughout your enterprise. And so I think there are a, a number of uh, uh, guideposts that are, that are being developed and being strengthened that any organization can follow, such as NIST has got some very important uh, publications regarding zero trust. MITRE, the Federally Funded Resource Development Corporation, has a supply chain uh, risk management framework that's very helpful for this. Uh, within industry groups, so for example, in the telecom industry, financial sector, there's a lot of information sharing on how to set the requirements and how to make sure that you, the principles are being followed to maximize assurance, transparency, and accountability. So I appreciate that overview, and now I'm kind of curious if we can zoom in a little bit on, on telecom operators, and, and I know this requires something of a generalization from you, but are they still in that trust but verified mode? Have they moved fully to never trust, always verify, or is it somewhere in the middle? Well, there are different levels of maturation depending on the organization. A lot of the larger operators, uh, the larger equipment suppliers around the world, are using, are using the principles uh, that are really around zero trust. And, and I would say uh, those principles really have to do with uh, verifying every user, validating every device, and then within that, limiting access intelligently. Uh, and so in the telecom business, for example, when mobile devices is connected to the network, that's a very strong encryption model that's continuously being validated. So it, it, it is completely consistent with zero trust principles. In addition, Processes such as when an equipment supplier under contract to a telecom operator is going to provide service to an equipment or to provide updates. There are certain configuration controls, oversight by the operator to govern whether, when, and how the equipment supplier is going to provide access and to make sure that only authorized transactions, only authorized people, only for approved purposes are going to be used. And so those are also consistent with zero trust principles. So I think it's moving very much in the right direction. We see Germany is uh, making some very substantial progress uh, with the recent laws that they're doing, and also their emphasis on uh, transparency and accountability, which I think is something that the community is recognizing after the solar winds and Microsoft Exchange server attacks, that we really need to do a better job in those areas. We've got to incentivize organizations to do what they need to do and hold them accountable if they don't. And Andy, I also wanted to uh, catch up with you uh, around what's going on between Huawei and the U.S. government. But before we look ahead, maybe we could look back a little bit. Uh, lots happened in the past two years, a lot of it around Huawei and affiliates being placed on the Commerce Department's Bureau of Industry and Security entity list. So could you maybe give us a high level overview of what the current regime uh, means for Huawei and how it's impacted the business? And the context, of course, is the transition from the approach of the Trump administration to some differences that we can already see in, in terms of the Biden administration. So we see that uh, the Trump administration was trying to negotiate some big geopolitical issues with China. And so they gathered together a bundle of things, including a number of actions uh, against Huawei and Chinese companies, certain criminal prosecutions where they took kind of recycled civil settlements and, and, and made them criminal. They put limitations on Huawei's ability to do business in the United States. They put limitations uh, through allies on, on allies buying Huawei into 5G. Uh, and they 
and they charged our chief financial officer. And they lumped those all together, as President Trump said, to use those as bargaining chips with China. And so that kind of aggregation of things for geopolitical purposes means there was a, a failure to focus on individual issues as they mattered. And we even see in some of the private sector organizations, the Telecommunications Industry Association, PIA, Information Technology Industry Council, you see some of the things that they have put out along with the Hoover Institution and some folks from AU Law School, basically saying you've really got to focus on what's national security, what's economic, what is the intersection between national security and economic, and we need to focus on what is of real concern? What are critical things and how can we put in place and develop or strengthen standards, conformance programs and independent testing to make sure those requirements are met? Uh, as ITI said, uh, the Trump administration had an overemphasis on one risk factor uh, for, from supply chain risk. I think they said there were 188 uh, risk factors in supply chain, only one of which is country of origin. So ITI and, and, and TIA, they made statements saying, look, there's an overemphasis on country of origin, and there needs to be a greater focus on what it really matters, what are the standards, what are the components that need to be evaluated, and making sure that we have a much stronger approach to supply chain risk. And now with these recent major cyber attacks, it's really emboldened everybody, I think, to create a new landscape and a new opportunity for government and the private sector to work together to, to really raise the bar in terms of supply chain risk. So when you look at SolarWinds and Microsoft Exchange Server, you have two trusted suppliers, SolarWinds and Microsoft. And they were violated by apparently uh, nation state level hackers. And so the idea is, look, we have to protect ourselves in, in this country. And so we need to raise the bar for everybody. We can't just assume that you know blocking one country company or a couple companies is going to help address the risk at all because it's not. I guess what strikes me when I look at um, all of the issues Huawei's had to face in terms of procuring U.S. made equipment or components with, with U.S. technology in them is that the company for the past two years has still continued to grow in terms of global revenue. Is that something that's sustainable or is there an inflection point somewhere on the horizon? Can you just kind of help me understand what the path forward is if we project the current restrictions into the future? Well, as you know, uh, Huawei is working hard uh, to reprioritize our products and uh, we've doubled down on our research and development. I think we're in the top three or the top five in the world last year with about, about $20 billion in, uh, in R&D uh, to help uh, change the life cycle of products to help prioritize products so we're less dependent on the, the components that are subject to the restrictions uh, from the entity list and the foreign direct product rule. Uh, ironically, most of the impact on our company is, is to our mobile devices, the chips that go into our mobile devices and our ability to use Android. And it's like, they're not really related to security. I mean, Android does a strong argument that having Android as the system that we use and in that collaboration with Microsoft, that helps make everybody safer. So it, it's kind of ironic. Um, I think uh, my particular concern, uh, frankly, because I think in the end, Huawei's gonna be doing do fine. Our, our leader, leadership of the company aren't gonna be fired because we're gonna to continue to take the hit that started to hit us at about 12 billion a year in, in, uh, in 2019. The fact is the question is the longer term impact on the US semiconductor industry is what's concerned to me. And, and I think that's most likely to be resolved in whatever way it's going to be by conversations between uh, the industry, uh, the industry association uh, and the government and elected officials to try to determine. And I think, again, this is disaggregating issues. Look at them in a clear way. Uh, what is in the best interest of the United States in terms of the question of whether American companies can sell non-sensitive technology to Huawei and other companies? For, for Huawei, back in 2019, we spent let's say 2018 was about $12 billion in procurement. That's about 40,000 direct American jobs. And if eventually, and it's, eventually is a long time, but uh, Huawei is going to be able to buy some of these components from other places, although we'd like to come back to the United States now, if we have an alternative, we're going to buy from other places. And those jobs are going to go away, and that's going to directly hurt Americans. So hopefully the focus will be, again, on what's in the best interest of the United States, in this case, uh, national security and economic well-being. Andy, earlier you mentioned the Biden administration. As we have this conversation, we're just right past his 100-day mark. And I'm kind of curious to get 
your opinion on whether some of the restrictions uh, instituted under the former administration will be revisited? Do you think things will stay the same or, or do you see a potential for the relationship to deteriorate further? Well, let's put it this way. I think we see in what the Biden administration is doing is, is a, a priority on things that are very, very important, some of which were not you know, apparently prioritized by the Trump administration. So for example, President Biden's executive order on the semiconductor industry and the executive order focusing on trying to understand what are the things at greatest supply chain risk to the United States and trying to help promote the American semiconductor industry with, with uh, research and development grants uh, and with various incentives. Helping American industry compete vis-a-vis -vis China and the rest of the world, that's great. Blocking companies doesn't really help America continue to grow its lead over China. And, and so I'm encouraged that the Biden administration is focusing on those things that can really make a difference uh, for America. Um, the eventual impact on the ability of American companies to, to sell the Huawei uh, remains to be seen. And uh, to wrap up here, Andy, I wanted to kind of bring this back to zero trust. This is a model that uh, you and I have discussed in the past that I've talked about with other executives at Huawei. And I, I know the company's even set up facilities where potential customers, regulators, other stakeholders can come in and examine products, verify and audit the security of those products. So really, what more can Huawei do to make this point stick and drive global adoption of a standardized process for verifying the security of, of any telecom equipment, not just Huawei equipment? Well, hopefully the work of the United States government in partnership with the private sector and with, America, with America's allies around the world, given the most recent cyber attacks, there, there really needs to be a recognition that these are very difficult issues and that we need to think about new ways of exploring it. So for example, in, in the high level government uh, track of talks called track one between China and the US government officials, there's a track two involving the private sector. And those groups are making some very important recommendations. And some of those uh, revolve around greater transparency. Um, I'd love to see experts come into Huawei facilities and, and into our competitors facilities to make recommendations about what can we do to provide greater assurance, greater accountability and greater transparency. Um, and on things like, how are the chips going to be used that we purchase? The idea of saying, okay, well, we're willing to enter into agreements as the track two folks have, have recommended. They'll take a close look at putting the ability to monitor uh, for, for approved use of technologies. Because when you have du dual use technology, that can be an issue. But we're open to having those conversations. And I think that's the kind of thing that, you know, that, that can really benefit everybody. Uh, in addition, the idea of saying, okay, uh, what is it that is necessary uh, in terms of standards and conformance, but particularly accountability? And I think the lessons we're seeing what Germany's trying to trying to, to roll out, the idea they're putting a particular onus on the telecom operators to make sure that they meet certain requirements and to make sure the telecom equipment and other third party suppliers meet certain requirements. And there are specific requirements on the telecom equipment suppliers. And the government's saying, look, telecom operator, you need to be able to know, you need to have visibility into what the telecom equipment suppliers are doing. And there need to be concrete requirements, concrete financial accountability, substantial accountability for the telco operators to do their part and for the telecom equipment suppliers to do their part. So what Huawei can do is continue to participate and try to encourage discussion about what's necessary to make cyberspace safer, what's necessary to make it more transparent, uh, and what's necessary to make and hold uh, not just governments, but also companies accountable on the world stage. Because I think there's some very important opportunities there uh, that can build on the UN uh, cyber norms to create mutual trust agreements where governments and companies sign pledges and subject themselves to the laws of other countries to meet the requirements that are made. And, and so there can be very substantial accountability. So we don't have all the answers, but we wanna participate in the discussions. We recognize the kind of path forward that's important. And we, we certainly applaud work such as Germany, the European Union are, are doing in these areas. And, and we look forward to uh, participating on the world stage to making cyberspace safer because uh, we, must, we must do that. Andy, I really appreciate you taking the time to have this conversation with me and uh, share some perspective on how Huawei is approaching uh, cybersecurity. You're welcome.